the change of filthy animals. There's no crying in baseball! Good morning, Vietnam! Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? To infinity and beyond! Go ahead. Make my day. Yeah, well, I saw it on a rerun. Welcome guys and girls to the Rerun Podcast, where two friends talk about TV and cinema from days gone by. Uh, we're your hosts, Daryl and James, and how are you today, James? Uh, yeah, very good. Um, You're getting on all right good, over there. Good intro, yes. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about Alan Partridge, who of course is uh, played by Steve Coogan, a character who's a failed TV host and radio host. Um, but we, although he's got a sort of a long history... With, uh, with comedy material, uh, we're going to be focusing more on the TV series I'm Alan Partridge, which kind of picks up his life after he's left the BBC and he's, he's lost his wife and his family and his home, and he's living alone in a travel tavern. Yeah, I guess you could say the first series is about, it's almost a quest for him to get back on the TV after knowing me, knowing you. Yes. Um, and then... Obviously, we meet Alan again in the second series a few years later, and now he's kind of sort of forgotten about TV and he's more concentrated on his radio show and his other show that he has. I can't remember the name of it. It's on something, is it Conquest? Like a channel called Conquest? UK Conquest. Yeah, I think the show's called Skirmish. That's the one, a military-based yeah. yes. uh, quiz show. Yes, I think it's funny how he... He boasts about it to anybody that he meets. <laughs> about it being the was it the highest rated TV show at that time of day in the Norfolk yeah. area. <laughs> it, and that, that's the thing about Alan. He always tries to find a win in every situation. Yes. Um, r- regardless of the the outcome. He always has to be on top. Yes. Needless to say, he has to have the last laugh. Yes, most definitely. Um, but yes, yeah, series one, uh, he's obviously living in this, uh, it's like a travel lodge type situation, uh, like a motel, shall we say. Uh, and the first episode sees him trying to get back on the TV. Um, so he's got a big meeting with Tony Hares, the director general of the BBC, in the show, of course. Uh, and this is like, the first episode is like an introduction to all the characters that we're, we're going to meet over the the next sort of six episodes of the first series. So you've got obviously Alan Partridge, Steve Coogan, uh, Michael, <laughs> played by Stephen Greenhall. And I just love Michael. He's one of my favourite characters. Yeah. From, um, it, it's like that thing, like Alan Partridge is the main character, but he does some things sometimes and you think, oh, what a dick. But yeah. like, Michael's just such a, a nice person that you just think you could get on with anybody. And it's the same for his uh, ever faithful PA Lynn. Mm-hmm. Uh, played by Felicity Montague, who is is always at Alan's beck and call, but he never treats her quite right. No, he's quite mean. Um, I was actually watching it the other day, and I, yeah, the first series I found find it funny where they could be together in in the car or whatever, and he's insistent that he doesn't take her home. He always drops her off at a cab rank or makes a walk or something. Yeah, like yeah, I think he makes it. You say to us something about it's only a short walk down the dual carriageway, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> at night. Yeah, um, and that just sort of shows his uh, sort of superiority complex mm. uh, that everyone is beneath him, regardless of their status. Yeah, um, uh, and we also sort of get the introduction here of uh, Phil Cornwall who plays yes. Dave Clifton. And I love Phil Cornwall. I've seen him in so many things over the years. And sort of Phil Cornwall, I, I sorry, Dave Clifton, the character of Dave Clifton, I think kind of, in a way, represents what Alan wants to be, a successful, liked radio personality. Yeah. Um, which I feel actually in series two, uh, Dave Clifton kind of almost role reverses with Alan yes. that Alan yeah. becomes a bit sort of higher in status whereas Dave Clifton's life's gone down the pan a little bit yeah one of the great things about Alan Partridge is it's got some memorable moments but it's also quotable yeah I think I use Alan Partridge isms pretty much every single day is that a word is that in the dictionary I don't know Alan Partridge is it should be we should it contact should Webster's it should be or Oxford dictionary yeah and the thing about the character of uh, Dave Clifton as well, you only you, you see him in 
series two, but after that, anything else that Alan Partridge has been doing, you don't see him until he pops up again in the film, and you he kind of talks about where his life has been in that scene at the beginning when he's speaking to um, Psychic Simon. Yes, and he's talking about spewing up bile and taking cocaine, and it just sounds like he's had a really bad life. <laughs> Yeah, and again, it's kind of like he, he kind of becomes Alan in a way that he's trying to look for the positives in all the bad things in his life. Mm. Uh, a, a memorable moment from the first episode of, of Alan Partridge is, uh, <laughs> please excuse my language, cock piss partridge, <laughs> which is the, the the vandalism on the side of his car, yes. uh, which uh, Michael tries to, <laughs> to make better by making it cook past Babbridge. Yes. Which I mean, cock piss partridge doesn't make any sense anyway. But cook past Babbridge no. is again a, the best of a bad situation. Yeah, and then later on in that episode, twat get, gets added on. Yes, at the end. Yes, uh, we see Alan trying to buy a house, trying to sort of make his way back up because he he thinks his his interview at the BBC is going to go fantastic. Yes, um, which obviously once we get there, it's a complete disaster. With uh, his his lunch with Tony Hares, which just starts badly, and <laughs> just gets worse as it goes on, because Alan starts to show his true colours. He kind of spits his dummy out a little bit, and uh, just makes a complete fool yeah. out of himself. Uh, and the famous quote from that scene, which is what I always I say it nearly on a daily basis, is "Smell my cheese, your mother." Got some cheese? No, thank you. Oh, nice. Mm, smells. Do you, to, do you want to smell it? No, smell the cheese. No, I don't want to smell it. Smell my cheese. Alan, please. Smell, smell my cheese, oh. mother. Oh, I, I think that's quite enough, thank you. I've oh, got cheese. This is cheese. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the monkey tennis one as well. When monkey he's pitching tennis? those ideas. Yeah. All terrible ideas. Yes. Which, you know, you've got to feel sorry for Alan in a way because. He just he wants a good life, but it's he doesn't want to work for it, and it's always at the expense of others. Mm. Um, it's like almost like across series one, it's just a complete decline uh, in his life. Yeah. So let's talk about some more uh, poignant moments throughout the first series. Do you have a favourite episode? Uh, I think my favourite episode uh, is probably episode three because you have the bit where he is singing that now racist well I guess it's always been racist but what would be classed as racist song about Chinese people yes the uh, um, the mixing pot song yes curly black and kinky mixed with yellow chinky can you still say that oh are you all right with that like because it's, it's it's a race of people and it's a food Chinese yeah you're absolutely right huh? yes uh, and then you also get that that funny story that Michael's telling Alan about when he was in the army to do with Chick Boys. <laughs> Bangkok Chick Boys. Yeah. And uh, just the way Lynn walks in and he sees Lynn and then he has to change what he's saying quickly. He puts his hand up a scud, gets a hold of the old meat and two veg, right? <laughs> he thinks, hang on, I've paid me money, I'm going to have so much. So he flips him over and he... F- <laughs> And funnily enough, it lands on its wheels and it starts first time and they just drive away. He also does that that water break promotional video as well, which is very funny because obviously he's in um, he's in trouble with the farmers and they end up dropping a cow on him at the end, and it's just all chaos and everything. But yeah, yeah I think that's one of my one of, yeah one of my favourites, if not the favourite episode. For me. Yeah. And we also see uh, the, a, a young Simon Pegg. Yes. Uh, cropping up. I'm not, I'm not sure if he did much TV work before then, but obviously he went on to do Spaced after that. Um, yeah. And obviously now he's he's one of those Hollywood rare British... Star. Yeah, one of those hair, but rare British actors that's gone on to um, be a prominent face and name in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. I think the other guy that was using the voice box machine, I think that's Peter Bainham. I think he actually wrote the wrote Alan Partridge. Right. Um so yeah, I think that's like a cameo scene for him. But no, it's it's good. I like the way, the way he intro- when he first meets them at the bar in the 
hotel and he starts talking with the voice box and Alan's a little bit like, what the hell's going on? Like, where'd you get that from, sort of thing? <laughs> yeah. I've been down the pub getting the beers in. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you speaking like that? Oh, it's a voice box. It sounds great fun. Where'd you get those at a toy shop? I don't know, I haven't got any vocal cords. Sound like the girl in The Exorcist. <laughs> But yeah, um, in in terms of Simon Pegg, he actually did a TV series called Hippies before uh, Spaced. I think he was in something else as well. There's a, there's a cameo in um, the first series of I'm Alan Partridge by Arthur Matthews and Graham Linen. Yes, the Father Ted guys. Um, and Arthur Matthews, I think it was Arthur Matthews, he actually wrote the series Hippies that Simon Pegg was in. Oh, right. Um, and he's also, like, between them, they've done, like, loads of stuff you would have watched on the TV. Uh, black books, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So. Um, it, funny, um, it, I mean, I've, I'll just ask you about your favourite episode. And it, I kind of have two... I mean, they're all good episodes. Uh, there yes. isn't a bad episode in Series 1. Um, the toss-up for me between my favourite episodes is the second episode... Um, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but uh, you, you're talking about the episode with Graham Linen in and uh, Arthur mm. Matthews. Uh, that's To Kill a Mocking Alan. Yeah. And this, I think this is the first ever episode I ever saw of I'm Alan Partridge. Uh, and obviously we, we see him, he's, he's meeting with these Irish producers because uh, they want his voice uh, for this. They want him to present this programme about Ireland. Uh, and obviously, again... He's messing it up because he's showing his, um, how can I put it? His ignorance side. Yeah, his, his ignorance of, of uh, other cultures and uh, other people's feelings. Uh, but we also meet superfan Jed, <laughs> who he meets in the lobby for an autograph and then asks to come back later on in front of these producers to make him look better than what he is. And through a series of crazy events, they end up going back to Jed's house with the producers and then obviously we, we end up in this crazy room where Jed's been photographing Alan from afar and he's got masks and... The, Even a tattoo. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, these people really exist in the world. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's a funny moment. And, and the best part for me from that episode is when Alan's actually leaving. Yeah. <laughs> and he's saying to Jed, yeah, yeah, don't worry, we'll go for this drink. And then once he's in the safety of his car, he just speeds off shouting insults at Jed as he pulls away. Yeah. See you next week, then. We'll have that pint. Yep. Go see my brother. In no way, you big spastic, you're a mentalist! <laughs> yeah, I don't think the insults of uh, classed as very PC in this day and age. No, they're not. <laughs> I, I think they were borderline back then, really. Yes. Uh, so that was kind of like my first experience of Alan Partridge, um, that episode. And I just thought it was absolutely hilarious. So it was that kind of thing that it drew me in. I had mm -hmm. to find out everything else about it. So, uh, But my the, the toss-up for my other episode, favourite episode, is Alan Attraction, which is the Valentine's Day episode. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> which, uh, I mean, it, again, it kicks off with... It seems like Alan's doing something friendly by getting everyone a chocolate orange but they're all damaged. They've been given to him for free because they're damaged, and all he has to do is plug it on air on his radio show that yeah. this shop's doing these chocolate oranges. And this includes probably one of the most famous Alan Partridge scenes, which is when he tries to, <laughs> tries to sing Why Do Birds Suddenly Appear to Jill, who he's on a date with in the restaurant, which just goes completely tits up. Why do birds It's just too high. It's just every time, every time. Um I love the way that in that episode Lynn is very, very jealous that Alan is like attracted to to Jill and she even tries to what's the word up upstand by wearing that that snazzy <laughs> snazzy sweater yeah <laughs> um it, it, it's it's funny the relationship between Alan and Lynn because I I yeah. often wondered was it going to be one of those will they won't they relationships mm. uh, because I, I think sort of 
although Lynn doesn't like Alan in some ways, she has quite an admiration for him. Yeah, uh, she sees that deep down there's a good person in there, and and he confides in her sometimes, um, like when he's come back from the uh, the country show, and he, he uh, Lynn says, "Who's upset you now?" And he just says, "Well, people in general. I just don't like people in general." And it's kind of like a softer moment then for Alan mm. to sort of he's he's almost saying to her, "I, I just need I just need a hug, just mm. need someone to hug me and love me." Um, and I wasn't quite sure if Lynn was going to be that person. Um, back to the episode with Simon Peggin, there's that bit where uh, Alan needs a wife for the promotional yes. video. Yeah. And this <laughs> and Lynn says to him in the lift, I could pretend to be your wife. And then they yeah. just stand in silence it's, until it's, they get off the lift. It's a very awkward moment. To take the world and all it's got, <laughs> keep it turning. I could pretend to be your wife. Yeah, and it's kind of like, like Alan's like, why would I want you to be my wife? But then there's this bit later on when Alan says, I want you to go to see this acting agency to see if you can get me a wife. But in that brief pause, there's this little smirk on Lynn's face like she's about to be asked to be yeah. his wife. And it's oh, it's just, it's kind it's, of heartbreaking in a way. Yeah, the way, the way that she says, I could be your wife in the lift as well. Just the way the way she says it and the look on her face, it's kind of like she's fantasizing about being his wife or something as well. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad they didn't get together. Really, it just because yeah. it it would have been an obvious thing for them to get together. But yeah. um, it, at the end of the day, I just think they're two different people because you know Lynn's very um, Christian. Uh, she's a Baptist, so mm-hmm. Lynn's very like religious deep down. Yeah, with a, a deep moral code whereas Alan will just step on anyone to get what he wants yeah I like the relationship that they have in um, the Alan Partridge movie it seems to just be almost kind of different like they're they're the best of friends aren't they yes yeah um, and they like she she always has Alan's back no matter what but yeah I, I like the way that they did their relationship yeah the, the, I mean, the character really could have ended there yeah, uh, it it would have been a good end. Obviously, the character's gone on to do uh, this time on the BBC, mm-hmm. and also uh, the Oast House. Yeah, and uh, what was the the radio show that he was doing? The podcast, sorry, he was doing uh, Mid Morning Matters. That's the one. Yeah. Um. It, so it, I think the character's always adapted with the times, um, and it's not a boring character. Um. It's one of them things. It's like it's almost like Steve Coogan doesn't exist anymore. Mm. He's just Alan Partridge. Yeah. And Lynn's boyfriend from series two. He wasn't mentioned in the film. I thought he might have made an appearance. Yeah, there was no mention of him at all, was there? No. I think the only real mention of anything from I'm Alan Partridge in the movie is towards the end when they're driving past the caravans and he says, "Oh, I used to live in one of those." Yes. And that's the only real reference you get from the past. Yeah. Of Alan. Because in series two, he's gone from the travel tavern to a caravan because um, he's yeah. having his house built because he's he's made his life a bit better. Yes. Um, and, I mean, we've, we've just talked about our favourite episodes from series one, but I, I found it hard to find an episode from series two. Not because it's a bad series or the, the, the episodes are bad. It's just, it's kind of, it's hard to find uh, something that stands out because I, I think the the level of comedy is so high throughout the whole series mm. it's difficult to pick a single moment out yeah I think the writing for the second series was a lot better as well yes uh, it focused there was a lot more going on it was a lot more complex like with more characters and a lot more going on yes uh, I mean one of the most memorable moments for me in series two is probably um, when we meet Dan Oh yes, <laughs> who I've often said looks like you, <laughs> which I, I, I firmly believe to this day. Although I say you look like a lot of people, but certainly, definitely Dan, played by Stephen Mangan, mm-hmm. um, is a strange bloke. He's, he's done a few different things over the years, and, and now he's on Sky Arts. Uh, I think it is doing a, a sort of like a, a Great British Bake Off style program, but about painting. Yeah, I think after Alan Partridge, I think he did the comedy. The- Sorry, Channel 4 comedy show, uh, Green Wing. Yes. He was in that, which was actually a good show. Yeah, I, I sort of caught the first series of that, but kind of dropped it from uh, from that point onwards. Yeah, it was a very odd show. 
the way it moved and it was like bite-sized bits of like bite-sized sketches almost yeah but within like a, a series and all set in the same sort of thing there was no sort of like a sketch and then cut to the next sketch it was all kind of centered around the characters in the hospital and everything uh throughout series one and two of alan partridge we get these um sort of like a glimpse into alan's mental well-being or lack of uh with these cutaways uh where we see him in this kind of like um fantasy of him dancing in front of uh tony hairs for the bbc yeah asking him for for a second series and it's kind of like his um his desires to do anything to get back mm -hmm. on the tv Like a lap dance for you. Uh -huh. I want a second series. But then in the second series, yeah. uh, we don't have like a fantasy cutaway. We have like this low point in his life where <laughs> he has these like blackouts and he, he looks back to his time when he drove to Dundee in his bare feet and ate a load of Toblerones. Yeah. And put on tons of weight. Scoffing the Toblerone, yeah. Yeah. And it's. Yeah. It's kind of it shows the the vulnerabilities of the character um, that even now he's he's sort of got back to a level mm -hmm. that he's happy with. He still can't let go of the fact that he was down at the bottom. I was going to say you were talking about the second series and that you didn't really have a particular favorite episode from that series mm -hmm. um whilst again the series is like full of like really good memorable bits and quotable bits and stuff like that i think one my favorite episode from that series would have to be um the color of alan episode two i think it is yes um where he does his book signing and promotion at the train station yes um and you have that old lady asking him what time and platform that train leaves from and he's telling her that she has to run to get it and and then that's where you meet uh dan sorry not dan it's um it's pete sorry pete from dante fires yes, yes. who's doing the the uh the talk for yes and again it shows alan's ignorance because he thinks he's from birmingham but he's actually from south africa yeah, and then he keeps and then he keeps mocking his accent. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's an insult to injury. And then the classic moment when he's asking to do jokes at his presentation. Yes, and he says no, you can't. But Alan takes it as something a bit more risque. No clowns, no gags. Just just a couple of jokes. No, Alan, no. Please. No, you can't. <laughs> well, there's no need for that. <laughs> To a couple of jokes. You can't! You've done it again! <laughs> you said it again! Just that, that whole scene when he's having that um that meeting with him in his makeshift headquarters. Yeah, and once again it's it's kind of Alan going back to his his uh basics of trying to make himself look better than what he is. Yeah. Which is a great thing because although there are differences between the two series, uh the the writing was good enough to maintain those character traits all the way through. Yeah. Uh, without altering Alan too much. Obviously, he's older. He looks older. He acts older. But also with that that same childish tantrum ways that he has about him sometimes. Mm. And obviously, yeah. that episode contains the classic foot on the spike moment. Yes. Um, and another great bit from that episode that I always loved, and every time we watch it, I always say, "Oh, watch this bit! Watch this bit!" is when he says he's he's booked the the conference room at the hotel, sorry, at the social club, under the name of the Real IRA. Yeah. <laughs> and the door opens, and there's a copper standing on the other side, and there's, yeah. we, we don't get any more of that conversation other than we have to leave. But I yeah. just it's that brilliant sort of it's not in your face comedy. It's kind of subtle. Mm. And that's that was kind of the thing about Alan Partridge. It's not slapstick. It's not it's not like the way Bottom was. You know, it's totally in your face all the time. It's kind of silly mixed with clever comedy. Yeah, it was kind of I was going to say sophisticated. Yes, that's a better word. But yeah, there's just lots to pick out from that 
episode for me in particular um just the stuff we've spoken about and as you say like each time he, he goes to the that club that he goes to he's always saying that he's he's let off a bag of anthrax or something and they let him in and he's just really disgusted with it but he keeps doing it he keeps pushing the pushing the barriers mm. until so eventually he gets locked out and then he pierces his foot on a spot <laughs> <laughs> Alan, what are you doing? Climbing over a fence. Oh, you should watch yourself. You're nearly fit. Were you going to say I was nearly 50 then? Right, we're nearly 50 then, but at least I can make the <laughs> What? <gasps> Little I've pierced my foot on a spike. <laughs> it really freaking hurts like that. Even then, Lynn has his back because she she offers to present the um, awards, doesn't she? She does, and I would have loved to have seen her do it. Yeah, I, I, um, I always felt like Lynn could could contribute so much more. Yes, but according to Alan, she can't present a cat. <laughs> Lynn, you couldn't present a cat. <laughs> Whatever uh, that's supposed to mean, but yeah, <laughs> it makes us laugh. <laughs> and obviously, Alan has a lot of interests. Abba being one of them, yeah. Because uh, obviously, his his talk show, TV talk show, was called "Knowing Me, Knowing You," mm-hmm. um, which obviously is an Abba song. His kid was called Fernando. Uh, what was his daughter's name? Well, oh, there's a pub quiz question. That is a pub quiz question. We'll find it out and we'll put it on our Facebook and Twitter feed. I actually have a kind of. Uh, question for you see yeah. if you know okay um something i picked up on the other day when i was watching the first series mm-hmm. how many times does alan mention bill oddy throughout series one? Oh, he does come up a fair bit doesn't he yeah be oddy yes looks looks like body <laughs> yeah what's rude about a body <laughs> tits <laughs> <laughs> um oh that is a good one i'm gonna say five Oh, you were spot on, yeah. Really? Times. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, it'd be too much for every episode, so I'll just bring it down one. Yeah, I also did look, it, did, it came across throughout the series as well that he said this country a lot, but I couldn't actually find out how many times he actually said that throughout the first series. He always seems to be um, disgusted with people's reactions or the way they did things. Yes. By saying this country. And obviously... Another interest of Alan is James Bond. Yes. Uh, Because he he has this uh, infatuation with Roger Moore, who he thinks is the best Bond, um, despite everyone saying that it's Sean Connery. Uh, Who do you think was the best Bond? Uh, Sean Connery, and then there was Roger Moore, wasn't there? Roger Moore was kind of a little bit more slapstick, I suppose. His films were a little bit more tongue-in-cheek. Hmm. I think Pierce Brosnan was pretty decent as James Bond, although his, his later films... Weren't, weren't great, but that doesn't mean he wasn't a great James Bond. It was just no. the, the writing. Goldeneye was pretty good. I thought he was good in that. Um, yes. A lot of people say Daniel Craig, but I, I'm going to be totally out there. And I always say Timothy Dalton. Yeah. But I've refined that now to um, the guy who played jo- James Bond just the once, which oh, was yes. George Lazenby. Yes. Um, if you watch that film, there's so many subtle things in that film that kind of show him actually as a secret agent, uh, yeah. and it shows like the the more meaningful side of Bond. Instead of just getting it off with women and stuff like that, obviously he gets married to Diana Rigg, and I think he's the best James Bond. But anyway, we're off topic. Um, in the second series, we get the episode uh, "Never Say Alan Again." That's right. Where he's going to have his Bond weekend watching Bond films with his mate yeah. Michael, who's his carried Bond over from, from... Yeah, which uh, Michael's carried over from Series 1. Yeah. Um, again, another cameo appearance. Uh, we have uh, Peter Serafinowicz. Yes. Um, who is funny. His career, I think, I think he's a funny man. And he had the TV series The Peter Serafinowicz Show. Yeah. Um, which I don't think was very well received. And I don't think they did the second series, hmm. um, but I, I liked it. Um, I've got it on DVD. Uh, but obviously, he he famously provided the voice for Darth Maul in the Phantom Menace. Yes. Yeah. He was also in the Amazon TV show The Tick from the eighties cartoon. He was yes, um, um, and uh, also worked with Simon Pegg on numerous occasions. Yep. Um, um, he also popped up in um, Guardians of the Galaxy as well. Yes, yeah. It's it's one of those kind of like anomalies. I'd like to see more of him. Yeah. 
Um, but it's, it's it's almost like he's kind of like Alan Partridge. He's dare yeah. I say he he can't be on his own. He's got to be with. I somebody. believe um, I believe he had like an alter ego as well. I remember seeing him on episodes of um, Shooting Stars. Yeah, and he was made up. I can't remember what his name was. He had like a it was like a character, and he was made up, and he looked kind of like fat. <laughs> but yeah, again, I think that's another topic. <laughs> But yeah, the, the the standout moment in this episode is when Lynn comes in with the jugs of Sunny Delight, trips over and drops the Sunny D straight in the box with Alan's videos. Yeah. And just completely wrecks them. I got Sunny Delight. Don't kiss you. me again. Sunny Delight all over your James Bond videos. Then you shouldn't worry about it. Are they repairable? Uh, I'll just check them. Yeah, they're ruined. Excuse me. Tell you what. Tell <laughs> you what. <laughs> yeah, of course, we, we find out in this episode that uh, he's only paying a what? Is it eight grand a year? Yes. Paying Lynn eight grand a year, which is just terrible. Yeah, uh, and he, he under pressure from Lynn's boyfriend, he he raised it to nine and it, a half. Nine and a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wouldn't get out of bed for that. Yeah, in fact, um, I'll, I'll give you a raise. Eight, eight, eight and a half thousand. Nine, 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 nine and a half. Tear, tell you what. Tell you what, it's nine and a half thousand pounds. That's all singing. Tell you what, tell you what, it's nine and a half thousand pounds. Thank you, Alan. Oh, Mrs. Robinson, are you trying to seduce me? Yeah. And again, that just shows, you know, he's he's finally making some money with his his TV conquest. Mm. Uh, a quiz show and his radio show he's having his own house built and yet he's not sharing that with with Lynn yeah uh, I tell you who we haven't talked about yet is Sonia oh yes she only he, appeared for one series didn't she yes in uh, in series two he's, he's, uh, he's sort of a girlfriend uh, what is she Ukrainian or Russian or Eastern European yeah. Eastern you're just general Eastern European yes um, and she's a few years younger than him and she loves Alan. Alan, I love you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Alan, I love you. Thanks a Thanks lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you know, again, it shows his selfishness. He has what he wants from her. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, um, let's make love on the bonquette. And <laughs> he doesn't reciprocate that affection that she shows. Mm. Um, another great bit is, uh, I think it's, again, it's the Bond episode when uh, she says... Um, Oh, sorry, he stands up and he says, Oh, I love you, in a way. Uh, I love you, in a way. Yeah, it's, it's not like just, I love you for who you are and thank you for loving me back. Yeah. It's like a, a it's just a tool for him to use when he needs it. Yeah. Another brilliant moment from that series, and it's probably the bit that made me laugh the most, uh, is, is the uh, episode five, I Know What Alan Did Last Summer. Mm -hmm. when he comes into the caravan and, and Sonia's been buying all those London things. Yeah. The taxis and uh, and the buses and whatnot. And she's bought <laughs> she's bought a life size beef eater. Yeah. And he walks in the <laughs> he walks in the caravan and switches a light on it. She's there in front of him and he screams his head off and just stabs it with that receipt spike. <laughs> Kill the bear! Um, yes, I was going to say as well, in terms of Alan's relationship with Sonia, um, there's a funny bit, I can't remember which episode it's from, but there's a funny part where Lynn is watching her TV show and she's put the headphones on and he starts having a conversation with Michael and he's asking her, like, oh, you're still doing it so many times a week? And he's like, yeah, diary permitting. And they do all the actions in front of Lynn's and she's got a dirty look on her face and everything. It's, I just, yeah. I think it's really funny. And then Alan has to question uh, Michael because it looks like he's having sex with an animal or something, but he's just saying long hair. It's just, 
just <laughs> <laughs> but yeah Sonya's contribution to the series uh, I didn't really like her at first um, I, th I think it was just because I was so used to Alan just being on his own in a travel tavern mm. and then crops up in this house and he's got this woman kind of on off living with him uh, which even at the end when his house is finished she says oh I'm going to be made homeless and rather than saying move in with me he says I want you to move in to the caravan yeah you know he can't even commit to having her in the house no again it's that I, I want you where I can get to yeah. you if I need to and then there's this like sort of bittersweet moment in the last episode when Alan, uh, obviously Alan throughout the series is, is plugging his he's plugging his book, Bouncing Back, mm -hmm. uh, which nobody buys, nobody reads, nobody's interested in Alan Partridge. So at the end of the episode, all, all those unsold copies, is it 12,000? Yeah. Something like that. They're just going to be pulped. And it's it's kind of... It's a bittersweet moment because he's got back to some sort of level, but not back to the level that he was no. when he had his own chat show. And I think at the end, I think um, although he's peeved that that other book about the gangster has done better than his book and everything else, I think towards the end when he what's when you see him getting his book pulped and stuff like that, I think he sort of like finds a, a happiness, like he, he's he's happy where he is, he's happy the way his life's going. He doesn't need any more. Yes. And the, the critique of the book throughout the episode is that uh, every anecdote in there ends with him saying, needless to say, I had the last laugh. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, it's like, it's like we were saying before, that every situation he's in, he has to find a positive. Yeah. And even when he's writing about his own life, it comes through that every situation he's had, he has to come out on top. Because mm -hmm. in, in reality, he hasn't come out on top at all. He's kind of mediocre. <laughs> I'll tell you what amuses me, Michael. Really amuses me when, when people criticise my book just because I happen to use the phrase, needless to say, I had the last laugh 14 times. <laughs> uh, because, you know, you and I know in my life to date, I've actually had the last 25 laugh... 25 times. 25 times, exactly. I think that's what made the character so great. He was... We, we've watched him at his height and then he's come down to his lows and then he's, he's sort of he's halfway back up but he'll never quite be there. But it's... It's mm. enough for us. Yeah, something else I just thought of as well, uh, speaking about uh, Alan's and Sonia's relationship, um, and just Alan's... I think Alan's aware of his own ignorance and arrogance as well, because there's that, that bit, that scene in the second series where I think it's the, the bit you was on about where she keeps bringing back all these little trinkets and stuff for, mm. to do with London. And um, she gets upset and she runs off and they don't know where she is. And Michael like suggests getting another girlfriend and he's like, "What British?" <laughs> because he knows a someone that's someone other than from somewhere else, like Eastern European or whatever. Like they wouldn't be able to put up with him. And they don't know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. He wouldn't be able to get a British girlfriend because they just wouldn't be able to stand the sight of him or anything. Poor Sonia, really. Every person yes. around him, he's. Every person he encounters, their life is not better off for knowing him. No. He just causes trouble wherever he goes. He wants everything for nothing. Yeah. And just uses people. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't doesn't make him a bad person. He's not a no. bad person at heart because he has. He's his... just trying to get somewhere in life. He's just trying to chase something, but sometimes he goes the wrong way about it. Yes, exactly. That's it. Yeah. Like there's that scene where he's at that um, the awards for brave people, and he really wants to speak to the woman, and he uses that other woman that's in the wheelchair to get yes. a conversation, and then he like he pushes her away. Yes. Which is really really funny, but yeah, again, very arrogant of him and just using people as he sees yes. fit for his own yes. ends. Yes. Which again translates into the film Alan Partridge Alpha Papa when he finds out that he's on the list to be sacked from the radio station. Yeah. And it's either him or... Just sack Pat. Pat Farrell, yes. Yeah, Pat Farrell, just sack Pat. And it shows that, you know, again, he's he's under threat, so he must do whatever he can. So he gets sack Pat... Uh, sack Pat. <laughs> he gets Pat sacked in order for him to keep his job, which obviously then drives Pat to madness yeah. uh, and then comes in with a gun and holds the whole station hostage. Uh, but through the process of that, obviously, Alan gets notoriety 
and ends up doing a radio show live during a hostage situation, takes it out on the road, and then at the end, finally, when Pat's in jail and Alan's sort of, a- again, moved up the ladder ever so slightly, uh, he has a brief conversation with Pat on the telephone from jail, and then, bang, that's it, phone down. <laughs> Thanks, Pat, yeah. you've, you've, I've got all I need out of you now, bye. Yeah, I think it even says at the end, when it's before the credits, um, that Alan and Pat only stayed in touch for a f- few more phone calls or whatever, and then that was it. Yeah. In regards to the film, was another character that we lost, and I felt really sad when it happened, is um, when Michael tries to help Alan towards the end and he jumps off the pier, and they say in that bit before the credits, it says that um, he was never found and stuff, and it's just, that's quite heartbreaking. I know. Obviously, he... Michael's been in it since since the start, and now all of a sudden he's like, he's either missing or he's dead or something and it's just really dark yeah i would have liked to have seen more of michael in the film obviously when we do see him he's he's just his sort of uh shell-shocked ex-army character uh that he's always been and yeah it was it was kind of sad to have that kind of non-closure of his disappearance Mm. yeah Um, does the film introduce sidekick simon or did he come before that uh, no, Sidekick Simon was uh, was in it from Mid Morning Matters. I think that's when he first popped up. But he's a character that's now carried on to uh, this time. Yes. Which uh, I think is going on to a second series. Uh, yes, which, it comes out this year. Yeah, which again sees Alan back on the telly, on the BBC, in a prime time slot. Which again is where he wants to be, but it's it's not his thing. He's He's kind of like a replacement, isn't he, for the... Uh, the actual presenter yeah because in the first series the actual presenter I think was taken ill and then you find out towards the end that he dies and then Alan gets the, the job permanently even though he does such a terrible job at it yes and it's it's full of those uh, Alan Partridge quin- cringeworthy moments uh, <laughs> that but because it's live on the, supposed to be live on the TV there's no way out of it we mm. can't we can't cut away to another scene, or he can't say something behind someone's back. He's got to deal with it there and then. Um, and I tell you, a, a great piece of writing that I love in that is uh, when he has the dialogue, like the exchange of dialogue with uh, Ruth Duggan, the uh, the outside broadcast woman who disagrees with everything he says. Oh yeah. Um, and and in the f- <laughs> in the first episode, he's trying to get her to agree with him, but everything he says she says like the opposite thing or elaborates on what he said so and then finally he says is this a good thing and she says yes and he's like bang thank you that's it again he has to have the last laugh Mm. and that's what he's always been about from day one up to now that's always here he has to be better than everybody else he has to be on top yeah but a great thing about i think about the the i am alan partridge series is that you don't need to have seen the stuff that came before no. to, to get what the character's about because uh, they yes. all they all loosely tie in together there is like a whole story arc if you watch it but you you don't necessarily need to watch anything you you can just yeah go to uh mid-morning matters or you can go to this time or you can go yeah. to i'm alan partridge just watch them pretty much in any sequence and it doesn't matter i agree i think alan partridge kind of you will see Alan Partridge, you'll know who Alan Partridge is, but it's interesting that they put him in these different situations and, and different styles. Uh, you've got like your, I'll, I'll say basic Alan, like one of the episode, mm. episodes was called. It's kind of, you've got your basic Alan, but then it's kind of like each time he's he's doing something, he's kind of different. So there'll be like an added layer to him or something. Mm. But you've all, always got that, that part of him that's like really selfish and arrogant and ignorant and just everything that makes Alan Partridge but it's just they change him slightly so he might have a bit of a a swagger in something and then he'll be completely different in something else but Mm. he'll still have all those all that basic stuff going on Mm. and obviously you had the radio show on the hour and then and then he was on the day to day and then obviously knowing me knowing you uh, which they were kind of what you might call reality comedies that we were supposed to believe that it was real. Yeah. Um, like it was a real talk show and a real news programme. And then he's suddenly put into a situation comedy um, where we don't have to believe it's real. We're just uh, observing his life. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so not a member of the audience, we're just observing from outside. And uh, apparently when they filmed I'm Alan Partridge, they, they had like a, a totally closed in set. So the audience would watch everything on a monitor, which is an unusual technique for a, a, a sitcom, normally with a, with a live audience. They're normally there and they can see everything. But I'm pretty yeah. sure I, I read somewhere that they, it was a, a closed set which again is is an unusual technique but um it just makes the program what it is uh, yeah. and then he's he's gone back to um you know he's doing the the podcasts and he's doing this time so now it's kind of though the character's gone from situation comedy back to reality comedy yeah something else that's interesting about the two series of I'm Alan Partridge is the way that it's it's filmed it's not like um even though it's a situation comedy like if if you watch it carefully you'll notice that it's kind of like the cameraman is like it's like freehand it's not you can't the camera's not stationary mm. it's moving around almost like it's filmed like a documentary style sort of thing yes which sort of links to what you were saying about his the reality side to him and then that's like looking in on his life but it's kind of like a documentary style the way it's been filmed yes one thing i wanted to mention is that there's an episode where he talks about the tie and blazer badge combination packs yes and many many years ago must be 12 13 years ago i was in woolworths uh that's how long ago it was no not 12 years like 22 years ago Hmm. i was in woolworths and um they had in there behind the counter alan partridge tie and blazer badge combination packs uh with the mask as well and I looked at it and it was like 15 quid and I didn't have enough money so I never bought it and I so wished that I'd had bought it because it's a great piece of memorabilia mm-hmm. um, that I'd just love to have today, uh, you know, from Alan's past. Um, but unfortunately, I, I let it go and I, I never saw them again. I should imagine you could probably find them on the internet somewhere, but... Uh, yeah, it probably would have made, uh, it, it would have meant a lot more if you would have had it from new rather than buying it as um second hand yes but it's got someone else's memories attached to it uh oh and something i did want to mention is that um series two uh when that started which is like uh 2002 yeah uh it's actually when you and i first became friends oh yeah yeah college. back back in college so when when i watch that series uh i can't help but subconsciously think about you <laughs> um in a clean sense, and uh, and then obviously when uh, when the episode comes along with that chap in it, Dan, who <laughs> I think looks like you, um, <laughs> it just takes me back to 2002, uh, wandering the halls of college, <laughs> quoting Alan Partridge. Yeah, <laughs> which my life have my life hasn't really changed that much. I, I I pretty much quote him on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. I do think even if uh, Steve Coogan decided. He didn't want to do anything Alan Partridge anymore. I think he's done enough for the character to be sort of handed down to different generations and for the comedy to sort of live on. And it's not like he's done too much either. Yeah. There's there's a lot of TV shows where you can see, oh, they shouldn't have done, uh, you shouldn't have done a second series or a third series or whatever. But it's because the the character, the situations the character is in has changed enough over time to make still make it interesting um it hasn't hasn't gone too far so that's been us two talking about our memories of alan partridge and uh where can they find out more information james uh yeah you can follow us on facebook and twitter um at rerun podcast so give us a like on there and share it with your friends and tell us your memories of alan partridge <laughs>